We are going to talk about acquired conscience again. Acquired conscience is based on self-love, which is based on fear. Self-love is orientated outwards, basically toward what people think. If our basis, if our foundation is going to be what people think, you can understand the ramifications of this in conjunction with fear, because people are unpredictable. They could think anything. And if your safety, if your well-being, if your happiness, if your survival is dependent upon what people think, you're going to have a lot of fear because there's nothing you can do about what people think. But you have to try. And there you have it. There you have the catch-22. Well, I can't do anything about what you think, but I'm going to try. Sometimes you do think what I want you to think. And I am under the illusion that I have somehow made that happen. That's our condition. We are literally under the illusion that somehow we made people think what they think. We can't make people think. People can't think, for one thing, but we certainly couldn't make them think, even if they could. If people flatter us, our self-love is gratified. If not, then we're angry or depressed, or angry and depressed, because they didn't think about us the way we wanted them to think about us. Think of all the fear that we experience about having our self-love wounded. By the looks on your faces, I think perhaps I'll just say that one more time. I'd like you to think for a moment about all the fear that you experience about having your self-love wounded. Okay, it's not working. I've got a couple of people that the light seems to be dawning, but others not so much. The vulnerability. How many people have a problem being vulnerable with other human beings? Good. Now we're getting somewhere. See, now, oh, oh that! Yes, well, there's, there is some fear involved with having myself love wounded if you mean vulnerability, if you mean somehow me being hurt. Yes, that's what I mean. Your self-love, your love of yourself being wounded. And that whole thing runs us, completely runs us. We don't know that. We think, oh, yes, well, oh, there's a little dot there on top of the mountain that's a little self-love. Oh, yes, I, I occasionally give it a thought. Oh, I, I don't think I really want to get that close to that person because they're not safe. No, it's just the opposite. The little dot is the thought that you might be wounded. And all the rest, the mountain, is how you live your life. That's the truth about us. The truth about us is we live in fear of being slighted, wounded, thought unkindly of, or misrepresented, or whatever or being talked about badly. I mean, when you think about all of the different possibilities of self-love being wounded, it's terrifying. There are so many of them. We have no basis of truth in ourselves. That's why we fear the opinions of others. If we had any basis of truth in ourselves, if we knew who we were, it wouldn't really matter what other people thought. But because we don't, because we're on such shifty sand, what other people think has a huge impact on us. Because we don't know who we are, much of who we think we are comes from what other people think of us. Actually, all of it, but I didn't think you were ready for that yet. Well, you know, we have to be brought to this slowly. This, these can be very shocking concepts. If the buffers are all taken away instantaneously, you go insane. And so the buffers need to be dissolved and removed slowly. And so this work takes a long time. How long? Well, as long as it takes. It takes how long it takes. Somebody asked me one time, how long does it take you to prepare one of these talks? It's taken me about 50 years, let's say, roughly. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more. But that's about how long it takes. Well, why is that? Well, it's because you draw from your experience, not just your knowledge. You draw from your being, not just your experience. And your experience is not your being, and your experience is not your knowledge, and your knowledge is not your experience, and your knowledge is not your being. All of those things are parts of something greater. Self-love can't be abolished completely. So we use it to love our neighbors as ourselves. We use it to love other people equally. Self-love is not an asset, let's put it that way. But in this work, we try to take the deficits and make them assets as much as possible. How we take this pending disaster that we call self-love and make it an asset is we try to love other people as much as we love ourselves. That's our benchmark. That's the standard that we set. Now, we don't often reach it. Okay, so we don't ever reach it. But it's still the benchmark. It's still the standard. It's like if you're on a bicycle and you're on the freeway and the speed limit's 65, you know that you can't go any faster than 65 on your bicycle. Now, anyone who's ever ridden a bicycle knows that you rarely get to go 65 on a bicycle. 
Now maybe if you've got a really fast bicycle on a really long downhill stretch, maybe you could reach 65. It's possible. I don't know if they do it in the Tour de France or not, but they come close if they don't do it. But it's a mark, it's a benchmark. You're not really going to reach 65 pedaling on a straightaway on a bicycle. Chances are, not a normal bicycle. I'm sure there are bicycles that could be made where you could do it. I'm sure that at Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah, they could probably come up with a bicycle that somebody could actually ride 65 miles an hour. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about normal living. We're talking about ordinary life. It's a mark that you don't expect really to reach, but you can still try for it. In a sense, self-love and loving other people equally is like that. It's not something we can expect to reach anytime soon under normal conditions. But with training and by having the proper machine, it's possible. And so that's what we look for. We look for that possibility and we look for training and we look for getting the machine in proper order. Ospensky said, if we've done something well, we can give self-love a tiny moment of satisfaction no more. A person full of self-love always is afraid because his center of gravity is outside of himself. He has nothing internal that he follows. Look at how changeable people are. Last week, didn't we talk about polls, like the Gallup poll and different polls that people take to find out what other people think so that they know what to do? When we look at that, well, that's politicians. Politicians do that. How the, how's he doing in the polls? Well, he needs to work in this area. Well, he needs to look better to these people. Well, he needs to reach out to those people. And we tolerate this insanity. Think about this. We put a man in office who tells us what we like to hear, even though we know that he's getting all of that information from polls. He doesn't have any idea who you are or what you want or care anything about it. All he cares about is what you think. And if he can make you think by manipulating the media, by manipulating the illusions, if he can make you think that he likes you, you'll vote for him. Think about that for a moment and the insanity of that. He has absolutely no intention whatsoever of serving any of your needs. He doesn't even know what they are. And if he did want to know, he wouldn't ask you. He'd ask pollsters. That's crazy, people. If you have a moment of clarity, a moment of awareness, a moment of real clear thought. You have to see that's insane. Yet, it's the way that we go. It's the way that we operate. If we have nothing internal, then we have to follow the external. Whatever that says, whatever the weather's doing, whatever the tide's doing, whatever the people are doing, whichever direction the wind is blowing. If we have no internal life, then our life is completely external, then it's completely mechanical because it's dependent upon whatever way the wind blows, whatever happens out there. For people who wish to be free from that, there is this work. For people who do not wish to be free from that, there is life. It's perfect. This work is not for everybody. This life is not for everybody. Some people look at this life and say, okay, it's a great life, and there's got to be something more. That's what I want. I want the something more. And then they use life to get the something more. There are other people who look at life, say it's a great life, or it's a horrible life, and there isn't anything more. And that's that. People do things from self-love and call it individuality. The most obvious example is teenagers. Look at teenagers. You'll see all these teenagers being individual, wearing their hat with the sun visor part of it crooked, sideways to one angle or another, or backwards or over here or over there. And if you go to a high school where there are a lot of them, you'll see that they all are individuals like that. It's like this uniform. Everybody's got their individual uniform. And it's all the same, but they call that being individual. What it really is, is self-love. Well, what does that really mean? What does self-love mean in that circumstance, in that situation? Self-love means is, look, if I look like everybody else, if I do what everybody else is doing, no one will criticize me, no one will wound me, no one will hurt me. I will be able to make it through this experience intact. My self-love will not be hurt. That's what it means. People take that self-love and call it individuality. What we need to do is see how we do that. Well, it's easy to see how teenagers do it, or people in high school or grade school, people who have to wear a certain kind of shoes or a certain kind of baggy clothes or a certain kind of tight clothes or a certain color this or certain whatever that, or they've got to ride this kind of bicycle or drive this kind of car, because if they don't, their self-love is wounded and they call it individuality. But we need to see how we do that. Self-love is obstinate and unintelligent, and it has a lot to do with acquired conscience, tradition, buffers, 
pictures. We've acquired all these pictures of ourselves. We have built up buffers around these pictures so that if some picture comes along that isn't the one that we've acquired, the one that we have said, oh, this is me. We have a picture. This is me. This is a good picture of me in our photo album. Here's the good picture of me. We put that right up front. That's on the cover. So anybody knows this is my photo album. This is me. This is what I look like. This is what I've done. These are my accomplishments. This is who I am. And that always looks good. We never find the worst picture and put it there. We always find the best picture and put it there. Unless, of course, the new contest is funny faces. And then we take the funniest picture, the funny face picture, and we put that there. But self-love is obstinate and unintelligent. Think about it. What's intelligent about wearing your hat at this crooked direction? What's intelligent about wearing this kind of t-shirt? What's intelligent about doing what everyone else has done? Well, there's nothing intelligent about it unless there's some real value in it. And there's really no real value in it other than to our self-love. It makes us feel good. It doesn't get us wounded. It doesn't get us hurt. Therefore, it's good. So the acquired part of us gets stronger. The part of us that loves itself gets stronger. The part of us that needs to change doesn't have any desire to change because it's just gotten stronger. Self-love is based on keeping up appearances. Imagination plays a tremendous part in the unhappiness of life. Real love springs from real conscience. See, we've got a lot of self-love, but we haven't got a lot of real love. And real love is love that we could have express for others. We don't have a lot of that. Our love that we express for others usually can turn to hate in a moment. We don't talk much about love in this work. And the reason we don't is because we don't know anything about it. What we call love really isn't worthy of the word. And so in this work, we have a special language. Gurdjieff actually invented a number of words because he realized that the race consciousness and the understanding of the race of our species about certain words was so embedded that he would have to invent an entirely different word in order to try and get people at ground zero, give them a level playing field where they could work from something new in order to discover something, in order to break away from the old associations. This is a terrible problem, really, when you think about it. I say love, and there are 50, 60, 70, 80, 1,000 different ideas of what that means. Remember the happiness is fad that went back, it was a couple decades ago, probably. Happiness is a warm puppy, happiness is a vanilla ice cream, whatever. It was, it was crazy stuff. And people got to say whatever happiness was for them. Well, happiness is this. Happiness is warm, fuzzy slippers. Happiness is a warm blanket on a chilly day. Happiness is getting to stay in bed five minutes longer after the alarm goes off. Things like that. For us, love is like that. Love is, uh, you know, my dog. Love is my cat. Love is, love is whatever it is that is giving me what I want right now, just like happiness. Oh, so then happiness is love. Yeah, happiness is, yeah, happiness is love. And love is happiness. So then love is a warm puppy. Yeah, love is a warm puppy. And it's insane. There is no standard. There's no absolute. There's no, this is what it is. And everything else can be judged by this. Everything else can be determined and relative to this. See, the problem for us is that we have absolutes all confused. There are absolutes. But for us, all the absolutes are in acquired conscience. They aren't in real conscience. Because real conscience is relative. Real conscience doesn't have to have absolutes. But acquired conscience has to have absolutes. Laws, rules. It's always, these people are always like this. That person's always like that. This situation is always this way. You can see how formatory it is. It's either or. Unintelligent, as I said, obstinate and unintelligent. Right aim made from acquired conscience will be wrong. Right aim. We're talking about aims in the work. So you have an aim in the work. I don't know what your aim is. You probably don't either. Most people don't. Unless we talk about it every week, most people forget what their aim is. Why do they forget what their aim is? Because they forget to remember themselves. Well, why do they forget to remember themselves? Because we're machines. Because the easiest thing in the world to do is to allow the hypnotism of life to rock us back to sleep. Because sleep is very comfortable. And waking up is very uncomfortable. And so we allow ourselves to be put back to sleep. We forget our aim. But making an aim, a right aim, made from acquired conscience will be wrong. Until real conscience is slowly awakened in us, the work takes its place. In a sense, you're asked to trust this work. It's really a bodacious request when you think about it. 
We don't trust anything. We trust ourselves, which of course is the worst possible thing we could trust because there's nothing about us that is solid. There's nothing about us that stays the same. Everything about us is changing constantly. We have no real I, we have no real will, we have no real conscience, we have no real anything, yet we trust ourselves. Our standard for trust, our standard for love, our standard for everything is us, is ourselves. And we don't even know who we are. But we don't know that, but we think we do, which of course is a wonderful place to be. It's like imagining that you own the world. Well, that works out great until something comes along that conflicts with that, until somebody else comes along and says, no, I own the world. You're on my world, so get off it. You know, well, I can't get off it. It's my world, and you can't make me get off it. Well, yes, actually, I can make you get off it, and then the war ensues, which is exactly what war is, isn't it? I want this. No, you can't have this. This is mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's not yours, and you can't take it away from me. Oh, yes, I can. And there it goes. And that's what all war is about. I know, that's a little overly simplified, but I think you'll find that if you boil it down actually to the actual facts and the reality of it, you will see that it is just that simple. It is acquired conscience, not real conscience. So the work takes the place of real conscience until real conscience is slowly awakened in us. Aim from acquired conscience tortures you because it leads to nothing real internally. Give me an example of aim from acquired conscience. Well, that's fine. I'll give you an example. Let's say your business is failing. And let's say your business is failing because you're not treating people as nicely as you could. So you make an aim. You say, well, I'm going to treat people better. I'm going to start to externally consider people. And so you start to externally consider people. You put yourself in the other person's shoes. You externally consider them. And your business starts to get better. You get more calls, you get more referrals, your business grows, you make more money, you hire more employees, everybody's happy. You've got your aim. But because it came from acquired conscience, it gives you nothing internally. It gave you everything acquired. Well, what was it? I wanted money, I wanted to grow, I wanted more people to like me, I wanted this, I wanted that, and so it gave you what you wanted. You acquired more of what you wanted. But internally it gave you nothing. Now, how would we take that same scenario and do something with it internally? Instead of making an aim in order to acquire something external, you'd make it in order to become more conscious about and more aware of yourself. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's true. Better emotions may tell you not to be so difficult. You start to observe yourself. Self-observation. You see that you're a difficult person. You don't get your way, you're a pain in the butt. Better emotions in you say, you shouldn't be that way. You really need to work on that. And so you listen to those better emotions, those bigger eyes, those eyes that are more connected to the work and less connected to the outside world. And you say, that's true. And you begin to work on it through self-observation. And you begin to put yourself in other people's shoes. And you begin to externally consider what it comes from is self-observation and a deeper realization of your situation, which is exactly really what you just said. You begin to see yourself as you are. You begin to see your situation as it is. And out of that, you think this in here needs to change. Not so that anything out here changes, but this in here needs to change. That is right aim from real conscience. Whereas this needs to change so that these people will give me more of what I want. That's right aim from acquired conscience, and even if it's right, it's wrong. Doing from real conscience comes from the consciousness of what you're like, and it develops essence. Doing from acquired conscience doesn't develop essence. It develops false personality, or the acquired part of you. So let's say we've got something that we want to do, something that's, well, unpleasant. Anytime we change ourselves, it's really unpleasant, isn't it? I've never really found that many things pleasant about internal change. It's uncomfortable. I have to wake up and see what I've been like. I have to wake up and see what I've done. I have to wake up and see it's not their fault. I have to wake up and find that I've got to stop blaming other people for my life. I've got to wake up and find that other people may be difficult, but that's my problem, not theirs. I don't like that. I want it to be all their problem. I want them to change. I want them to make way for me. I want them to do nice things for me. I don't want to constantly have to go out of my way for you. Why does it always have to be me? Why is it I'm always the one who has to apologize when we argue? Why is it that kind of stuff? You know that kind of stuff. Yeah. The stuff you've heard in your head all your life. The stuff that you justified your whole life with. That stuff. That stuff is uncomfortable to change that. It's easier to change other people. Or so we think. They don't change, but we think it would be easier if they would just listen to reason and understand that we mean only good for them. We look at this ugly task of changing ourselves. And the only thing that can make it palatable at all 
is somehow we've got to make essence understand that these things are necessary. That's it. And that's what we do, isn't it? So we need to make essence understand why certain things are necessary. With acquired conscience, you'll do a thing for the sake of the form of it or some merit that you will get, not insight into the good of what you're doing for its own sake. But with this work, there are things that you will do for the good of what you're doing for its own sake. You understand that some things are simply necessary if you are going to make it from acquired personality to your essential self. If you're going to make it across that river, if you're going to make it across that gap from where you are to where you would like to be, there are certain things that you're going to have to do. And so you do those things because you understand that they must be done. Not because they're pleasant, not because they're comfortable, not because it's thrilling or exciting or entertaining, but because it needs to be done. That's what we're talking about. You can see how that cuts out a lot of people right now. Why should I do that? There's no reason. If you have to ask that question, there is no reason. There's no way to answer that question. There's no reason. And the only people who can answer that question are the people who have the question, why should you do that? If you want something more from life, then you know the answer. If you don't, then there's no question. What we learn of the good from the acquired side of us must be shifted from the outer basis so that it becomes a genuine, sincere thing. Everyone through life has acquired some knowledge of good things, be influences. Usually, the acquired part of us will use those things for its own merit, for its own satisfaction to benefit itself. What we've learned of the good through education on the acquired side can have its basis shifted to something more real so that we work on having it become more genuine, more sincere. An example, Rex learned that in business, if he gave jars of honey away to people, it would open doors. Now, that's clearly the acquired side, and it's clearly for his own benefit. Yet he could take that very thing and work on it and do it just to do something real in himself, to form something genuine in himself, to form something of actual concern for another human being in himself, not just for himself, but for the other person. That would be shifting the basis of something that he acquired in life through education. Something we wish to live, not imitate. We want to be it, not pretend to be it. We want to live it, not imitate it. But in life, the acquired side of us sees something and it goes, oh, I like that, so it imitates it. The acquired side of us sees something and says, oh, I like that, so it pretends to be it. And we end up with all this pretense and imitation and nothing real inside of us. And we go to look for something real and there's nothing there. Our guide in all of this is the action of the work in us and what it teaches once it's begun to influence us. I don't know about you, but I know that this work has caused me to trust it because as I apply it, I have found that it is trustworthy. In the same way that you step out on something and you test it, is this going to hold me? And it will. You step out, and then after a while, after you walk on it for a while, it's trustworthy. You have learned that it is worthy of your trust, so you give it your trust. This work is like that. It's like having dental work done. You have dental work done, and at first your tooth is sore, and you don't really want to bite down on it hard. But later, slowly, you learn to trust it. You learn that the tooth is trustworthy, and it's okay to chew. Everybody's had little experiences like this. And these little experiences, that's how the work trains us to lean on it, to allow it to influence us. It doesn't ask us to believe anything. It asks us to verify it, to find out whether it is trustworthy or not. You can do this. No one else can do this for you. So the work then becomes our guide. All of our concealed hatreds and contempts, the ones that we don't manifest for fear of reputation, exist in our psychological world, which of course is our real world inside of us. If we've had a lot of hate, we'll find that we're surrounded by hate. We end up cooking in the stew that we made. All this can be a problem, a big problem. There's some people who are completely overcome by their hate. It comes out in suspicion, it comes out in negativity, it comes out in constantly feeling rejected, it comes out in constantly feeling that people are trying to take advantage of them. It's a terrible place to live. And if you're tired of living in that place, then we have to learn to neutralize these things in ourselves. How? Well, first thing is to begin to see yourself through self-observation and not constantly blame others. Yesterday, Steve and I were talking, and I said something about that's all in your head. And he said, it is not. And he said, I can show it to you. And I said, yes, I know you can, and that's the proof that it's all in your head. And he got it for a moment. 
I don't know if he still got it, but he got it for a moment. He said, that's a good point. If you can show me something that isn't there, and of course anything you show me isn't there, then what you've shown me is the inside of your head. And if you can get that simple distinction and you can see that about yourself for a moment, you've won a little skirmish. You haven't won the war, but you've won a skirmish. Now there'll be plenty of other skirmishes and battles in this long war. But if you can keep winning these skirmishes here and there, eventually you will win the war. Eventually, you will be able to shift from who you are not to who you actually are. And who you actually are, your essential self, will begin to grow and unfold in a positive direction. We're full of pseudo-truth, and we continually spend our force keeping it up about ourselves. We have this pseudo-truth about us, who we are, who we think we are. And we spend all of our force keeping this whole thing going, keeping this whole pretense going, painting the mask. Yeah? It's like the Golden Gate Bridge. They paint that every day. Not the whole bridge, but they start at one end and they work, they chip and scrape and paint till they get to the other end. And then they do it again. Why? Well, because by the time they get to this end, that end over there needs painting again. So it's just a constant process. That's how it is with us. We've got this acquired self, this false personality that we've built up in life. And we've got to constantly go around putting makeup on it and fixing the cracks and fixing the broken parts and fixing the bits where it's chipped off and fixing this and fixing that, because life wears away at it. And light, see, the action of the sun, of the light on the bridge is what makes it chip and peel. It's moisture and things like that too, but sunshine, we've realized that sunshine, ultraviolet rays have a tremendous damaging effect on the illusion of life. <laughs> it's amazing, it makes real things grow, but it makes all of the stuff that we made fall apart. Isn't that interesting? Light does the same thing. If you allow light, the light of consciousness, into your life, it will make you stronger. The real part of you will become stronger and it will grow. But all the bits that you've made up, that you acquired, all of the made up stuff, all of that stuff, the ultraviolet rays will begin to destroy that. Wow, that's a great example. I wonder if I am the first person who ever thought of that. No, couldn't be. But it's a great example. I like that one. Real truth makes us quiet and gives us peace. You remember we talked about this before. The pseudo-truth makes us uncertain, worried, and tense. Why is that? Well, because it's not real. And if it's artificial, we can't really put our trust in it the way we can something that's real. It's like a fix. You know, you broke something, and it's never as strong as it was. I don't care what they say on the label of the jar or the glue. It'll be stronger than it ever was. Baloney. It will not be stronger than it ever was. Take a piece of wood, and you break it and then you glue it back together. Well, that glue joint may be stronger than the actual glue was, but the wood is weakened. The structure of the wood is weakened because there is a lot besides just the broken part, the obvious broken part, that was damaged in the breaking process as well. We don't see that, but it's never quite the same. Acquired conscience is noisy, but it's necessary to listen to real conscience. You really got to pay attention. But acquired conscience is all mouth. I'm throwing these things out so you can draw some distinctions between the two. The problems that we solve through acquired conscience always justify us. We solve a lot of problems through acquired conscience. There are people who are great problem solvers, and it's all through acquired conscience. And they always justify, every, th every time we do that, it always justifies ourselves. That's one of the things you can be sure of. This becomes stale, and then we begin to wish for something deeper. You solve all your problems with acquired conscience, eventually... You want something more. It's how you got here. It's how you got to the place in life where you wanted something more. There's got to be more. There's got to be something more real. There's got to be something deeper. There's got to be something more lasting. There's got to be something more fulfilling. That's because acquired conscience, even though it's doing the task, it's not doing the whole task. Until that time comes, you're not ready for this work. When we come to the place where these things make sense, I am not like this. I am in this lie. I am in this invented person that has taken charge of my life all these years. Recently I wrote a piece about being in the machine, being stuck in a machine and wanting to send a message out in a bottle or a little message out in a fortune cookie help. I'm a prisoner in a fortune cookie factory. So many people missed the whole point of it. Like they thought I was miserable and I said, no, you don't understand. I'm not miserable at all. I'm actually quite happy that I realized that I'm a prisoner because you people don't realize it yet. You don't realize that body snatchers came at night while you slept and took your body and imprisoned you. That you're not 
free anymore. You're not awake anymore. You're not in charge of your life anymore. Something else has taken charge of your life and is running it. And there's nothing you can do about it until you begin to see I am in this invented person that has taken charge of my life all these years. When you begin to see that and the terror of that strikes you, the depression of that strikes you, the fear of that strikes you, the loathsomeness of that strikes you, that's when you begin to understand what this work is about. Until then, this work is not for you. This work, means not, this work doesn't mean anything to you. But you can see, I'm not like this. Why am I behaving like this? I'm not like this. This is not me. And I don't mean making an excuse. I mean literally seeing. We're literally seeing, I'm in this lie. I'm stuck in this lie and I can't get out. I don't even know what the truth is. But I do know this. I know this is a lie. I may not know what the truth is, but I know that this is a lie. And 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 if you can start to sort out all the lies, eventually you will find the truth. This is the beginning of understanding this work. The object is to awaken real conscience, which is the same for everyone. Self-observation shows us what we're not. It's really what we're talking about. It's about finding the lies. Self-observation will show you what you're not. If you're doing self-observation properly, if you're really doing it, not identified, looking at yourself as an interesting stranger and seeing what you see without identification, without upset, without all of oh, the justifications and the insanity of it. Just see it for what it is. See, well, that's the way that is. If you're doing that properly, it will show you what you're not. Now, most people think that giving up means death, but it's not death. It's life. Giving up what you're not is life. Giving up the very things that have promised you to save your life that will not save your life. And you only find this out through self-observation, proper self-observation. That's life. But it's all confused in the acquired part of us. It's all confused. We believe the lie instead of the truth. Everybody here has seen me work with somebody about one of their lies and they cannot see it and they defend it. And you sit there and you go, why aren't they getting this? Why can't they see this? Unless it's you. If it's you, then it's like... <laughs> Why is he picking on me? <laughs> Why is he doing this to me? Why are they all agreeing? They're all a bunch of yes men, the creeps. We don't see it until we see it. The work says no one is happy. We invent happiness with acquired conscience. And the strange thing about it is it's the very thing that continues to make us wretched. The very thing that we invent to make us happy, this invented happiness. So this is, happiness is invented. What is happiness? Happiness is a warm puppy. Happiness is fuzzy slippers. Happiness is a blue sky. Happiness is pink balloons. What? That's all invented. If there is happiness, then what is it? Happiness is being what you are. Just accepting what you are and being that. Well, no wonder there's so little happiness in the world. We don't know who we are. How could we possibly accept it? Find out who you're not. Keep finding out who you're not. And eventually it will lead to who you are. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Remove this piece of hay, 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 ad nauseum, and eventually what will be left is the needle. That's the idea. If we had real conscience, the whole world would unite with one understanding, one language. Law, legislatures, Congress, politicians, police, the military, all that control would all stop instantaneously. Because everyone would have real conscience, everyone would see the same thing the same way. And this is the utopia that everybody talks about. This is what everybody's working for, world peace. Isn't this it? Get rid of all the guns, get rid of all the military, get rid of all the police, get rid of all the locks on all the doors. Well, what would make that possible? Nothing we know. Real conscience is the only thing that could make that possible. If everyone could actually literally agree, if everyone saw everything the same way. But then we'd all be machines, so let's have it the way we have it. <laughs> well, no, we're all machines now. But isn't it interesting that machines say that the only real thing that we could ever have is mechanical and that the only unreal thing that we have is real? The machine would call itself real and call you mechanical. I just find that very interesting. We work on a common language in this work so that we can reach real conscience. Acquired conscience is rigid. It's fixed. Real conscience is relative, not absolute. And think about that. Think about what that means this week. See if you can discover what that means. Make that your aim for the week, your intellectual aim, to try and understand that real conscience is relative, not absolute, and acquired conscience is rigid and fixed.